Good afternoon and welcome to our COVID-19 vaccination webinar. How have small countries overcome the challenges they face in vaccinating their population? This is today's uh, question and um, today I'm more than happy to co-host this webinar with our colleagues from WHO Euro and I also would like to invite my colleague Bettina Menne, coordinator on the health settings program from WHO Euro and Bettina will quickly introduce the topic and also uh, introduce the speakers we have lined up for you today. Bettina, please take the floor. Good morning to everybody and I hope everybody is doing fine. We have the pleasure today to present actually a little bit about uh, some of the work we are doing with the small countries and I have the pleasure to have with us today Claudio Muccioli from San Marino, Neville Kaliluja from Malta, and Moisa Gobek from Slovenia. And the Small Country Initiative is composed by 11 countries, out of which six are European Union countries, which are Cyprus, Estonia, Latvia, Luxembourg, Malta, and Slovenia. And five are non-EU countries, mainly Andorra, Iceland, Monaco, Montenegro, and San Marino. Since 2013, we have created the Small Country Initiative heavily uh, promoted at the beginning by San Marino. And over the years, we are now 11 countries working together on three main aspects. First, to give the small countries a political voice in the international agenda, health agenda, to make strategic, to discuss strategic decisions and health priorities, and to share the lessons learned. And one of the issues we recently did, we looked at the COVID-19 lessons learned at the high level meeting, which was held last week. And one of the aspects were vaccination. As a background to this, a paper was developed which looked at the, vac the rollout of vaccination in the small countries and the lessons learned and how to move forward. With this, uh, I think I have a little bit introduced the topic and give it back to Matthias. Thank you so much, Bettina, for introducing the topic and also providing some uh, background information on this uh, very important initiative. I think this is highly appreciated, not only by the small countries, but also by us to learn more about it and to understand the diversity of our region. And this is the moment where I ask my colleague Erica Richardson to present the audience poll. Uh, Erica, please. Hello there. Welcome, everybody. Yes, uh, we just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, to see where you are at, as an audience. Um, and I'm just going to launch it. There we go. So two, just two quick questions for you all. One, do you currently live in a small country? However, you define small country. Um, and then the second question is, in your countries, what are the challenges you've faced in vaccinating your population against COVID-19? Now, for the second one, you can answer as many as take as many answers as you'd like. But has the problem been procurement of vaccines, scaling up vaccine centre capacity, pr prioritisation of different groups, vaccinating hard to reach groups, and addressing vaccine hesitancy, issuing vaccination certificates, or actually none of the above? Okay, but we really look forward to um, hearing. Uh, about your experience and I'll present the results after the keynote presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. And while you are making your, your choices, <laughs> I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Leda Neymar. She is working for WHO uh, in the regional office for Europe. And uh, Leda, the floor is all yours. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for opening, Bettina. My name is Leda Nemmer, and I am a WHO consultant working at the European Center for Investment for Health and Development in Venice, Italy. Today, I will provide you with an overview of how the COVID-19 vaccine has been rolled out in small countries. Now, this snapshot was prepared by Katie Palmer as first author, Bettina Mene, and myself as a background document for the seventh meeting of the high, of seventh high level meeting of the Small Countries Initiative, which took place last week. So what it was the aim of the snapshot? The analysis consisted in identifying the challenges that countries have faced in procuring vaccines, setting up vaccination sites, and in administrating vaccines to different priority groups. 
We also describe the current systems for vaccine registration and vaccination efforts for the general population, as well as for vulnerable groups. And the snapshot also shares the methods that countries have used to address issues such as vaccine, vaccine wastage and low vaccination uptake. So the table on this slide shows the percentage of the whole population in each country who had received at least one dose or have completed the dose series of any vaccine by the end of May, 2021. So this means that by June 1st, 2021, more than half of the population of Malta and San Marino had already received their first vaccine dose. While in most of the other selected small countries, over one third of the population had received their first dose by the same date, by, the, by June 1st. Now there were several reasons for different vaccine uptake in several countries. This range from vaccine availability, geographical reasons, lower access to information issued by national bodies, and differential access to information and vaccination sites. Generally speaking, more research is needed to understand low uptake that countries, many of the small countries faced. So what has been the situation so far in small countries with regard to COVID-19 vaccine rollout? Well, all the small countries have drafted and launched national vaccine deployment plans for COVID-19 and regularly updated them. Work on this snapshot revealed that some countries have a set, that the small countries have a set of shared challenges still to overcome. These range from procur procurement of the vaccine, which relied on availability and or country power to negotiate, administration, the need to repurpose that repurpose facilities and staff, communication, booking, which was digital versus non-digital, um, prioritization, and uptake. So in this slide, now I'll go into, in the next few slides, I will go into each one of these and provide you some examples of what some small countries did to address each issue. So with regard to procurement, the six, e, the six EU small countries were part of the EU joint procurement of EMA approved vaccines. The non-EU small countries secured vaccines using different mechanisms, which were hybrid, bilateral purchases, COVAX facility as a self-financing country, and some even made direct orders from companies. Uh, for example, Andorra used a hybrid method by procuring bilaterally from France and Spain from their EU negotiations and from COVAX as a self-financing country. Montenegro, on the other hand, procured through direct orders from companies through COVAX and via bilateral and trilateral agreements with countries and vaccine manufacturers. With regard to administration, COVID, va COVID vaccine administration relied on facilities and personnel. For most countries, there were insufficient existing vaccination facilities and repurposing was necessary, as I said before. Um, and the, the vaccine administrating personnel themselves varied. So a few examples from the small countries, Monaco and San Marino opened, had to open up one to two vaccination centers. Malta created non-medical vaccination sites in university campuses, in council offices and military facilities. Estonia offered vaccination in some workplaces and engaged four mobile units. And as you can see, personnel ranged from nurses, medical students, retired medical staff. One country offered online training for immunizers. So approaches were really varied. With regard to public communication, many approaches were used from campaigns to inform about eligibility, targeting hard to reach populations and wide outreach online and offline campaigns were necessary. So a few interesting examples were Estonia, where they realized there was especially low uptake in older individuals in one county. So what did they do? They, they launched a one plus one campaign where younger persons can receive a vaccine if they accompany an older relative, friend or neighbor to the vaccine site. Malta set up a broad communication strategy targeting the specific age groups through various media and actively sought to to uh, counteract the misinformation. And I'm not going to say more about that because I know we have our colleague from Malta who will be speaking after. Luxembourg had a clear, clear campaign posters in five languages with specific information on characteristics for vaccine availability, the eligibility. And Latvia in, in initiated a campaign to proactively 
phone telephone call individuals aged 60 and over in less vaccinated parts of the country. With regard to booking systems, they were largely digital, but there were also combinations of telephone and online systems used. Latvia and Estonia, for example, had interactive maps on their COVID websites to enable individuals to search for the closest vaccination centers. Um, Estonia, Luxembourg, Malta, and Montenegro set up mobile teams for people receiving medical care at home. Some vulnerable, vulnerable groups are contacted directly by family physicians, by post, by letters from local authorities. Um, all countries now have some form of digital system for vaccination, registration, booking, waiting lists, but they also have telephone hotlines and non-digital systems in place for older persons or persons who could not access digital systems. So with regard to vaccine prioritization in the small countries, it happened first according to risk, advanced age, a person living in a long-term long care facility or geriatric facility, then by comorbidity conditions, and then frontline workers such as healthcare workers. Then some countries opened up to other priority groups. For example, Andorra, Iceland, and San Marino extended vaccination to employment categories such as emergency services, prison, and education staff. Luxembourg and Malta opened vaccines to lower priority groups. For example, um, if a person was able to reach a vaccination site within 20 minutes, then the, vaccine, the vaccines were sometimes open to these people. Uh, if a higher priority group person canceled or was unavailable for their vaccination, these were made open to lower priority groups. Carers or household members of people vaccinated at home were also given vaccines. And San Marino offered vaccine to tourists. And I will let San Marino provide more information on that. Andorra, Estonia, Luxembourg, and San Marino also opened up to non-priority groups to reduce vaccine waste. And a few countries, Iceland and San Marino, deprioritize de people who have had a documented COVID infection in the past six months. So as you can see, there is a range of, of different approaches that countries took to reach populations, to avoid waste. So small countries in the European region made tremendous efforts to address numerous challenges faced during their COVID-19 vaccination rollouts. And when you read, when you read further, and I hope from this presentation, you've seen that there, are there have also been numerous innovative solutions that have been implemented. And the publication features two tables that I wanna draw your attention to. One has a summary of key challenges faced by the small countries. And the second table has examples of good practice. So you may find that interesting when you look at the full publication. Some of the barriers small countries face will, will still create challenges to ongoing and potential future vaccination rollouts. And, and so countries will need to be ready for, for these unknown challenges. So small countries are now being faced with a number of, of challenges. And this is the slide I would like to end with. The first challenge is, is that of meeting the European Technical Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization recommended interim vaccination uptake target of 80% of the adult population as soon as possible. Vaccine administration and planning will remain a challenge and it'll and it will continue in the midst of uncertainty of the pandemic's progression. Pre-planning the human resources will be necessary because the redeployed health workforce is now going back to their pre-pandemic roles. So this has to be planned for as well. There is uncertain science yet on how and when additional booster or doses will be needed and how, how that will, will be played out. And the issuing of vaccine, vaccine certificates is of high interest to, some, to, to the small countries. And it's a particular challenge for non-EU countries. And we also need to understand the effectiveness of digital tools in vaccine mon monitoring, allocation, and booking in the small countries, and understand which population groups need alternative non-digital booking and monitoring systems. And an increase in mobile units to vaccinate hard to reach individuals and reduce health inequalities may also be necessary. And last but not least, how to address vaccine information and its effect on uptake in the population will need to be faced head on. So this last slide just presents the challenges and what the small countries will be needing to look forward, forward for. And last but not least, 
I would like to, to share, to thank all my co-authors, namely Katie Palmer, the first author on the publication, Bettina Mene also, um, and special thanks to Siddhartha Data, Jose Hagan, Roberta Pastore. We're grateful to the colleagues, Sherry and Anna at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And last but not least, I would like to thank the members of the Small Countries Initiative for providing us with data and information which made the development of this snapshot possible. Without their input, this would not have been possible. So thank you and thank you very much, everybody. Leda, thank you so much for this perfect and very concise overview. I think it came across very clear what effort the countries had to do, you know, procurement, administering the vaccine, public communication, booking, prioritizing. Even large countries are um, very challenged by, by all this, and they have much larger capacity for planning, actually. So it's quite interesting to see how small countries have uh, mastered this. And actually, what other countries can, can learn with it, from it, um, which have larger capacity. So thank you so much. And Erika, I think this would be the right moment now to present the results of the poll. Yes, so very interesting results, as ever. So uh, in our audience, most of our audience, two thirds of our audience currently live in a small country, which is, um, which is interesting in itself. Um, and the main issues that they're facing are around addressing vaccine hesitancy. So I think we're all looking forward to hearing um, the spotlights, but particularly maybe Malta, who's coming up next, because that's one of the issues that Neville's going to address. Um, but so, yes, interesting results. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Erica. That's that's great. And uh, without further ado, Neville, I would like to give the floor to you. Neville, please. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So basically, um, some of you might be aware that we can say, I think, Malta had a fairly fast rollout of vaccination. Um, and that's what I'd like to sort of discuss briefly with you. Um, uh, part of that was also obviously thanks to the thanks to Malta being able to benefit from the EU Joint Procurement Advanced Purchase Agreement with several brands. Um, that said, even when they were being deployed, sort of when we were getting the vaccines, obviously uh, we were uh, kept back, so to say, by supply and also by the licensing by EMA. So, you know, obviously, uh, as you can see, some of the brands they have on the slide are actually not, not licensed yet. Uh, in general, because again, if we was talking misinformation, unfortunately, we did have some government driven misinformation in some European member states as to how Malta is getting its vaccination. Um, everything was above board. So the European Union last year did issue an expression of interest for the different vaccines. There was an agreement here between the Ministry for Health and Ministry of Finance to facilitate the purchase of the, you know, whatever is made available to us by the EU. So basically Malta did not refuse any offer. Some other countries were a bit more picky and then obviously they paid the price later on. Um, that accounts for the difference in the rate of rollout between Malta and other EU countries. Obviously, depending on supply, we had priority groups. Um, uh, priority groups were roughly along the lines of the recommendations made by the WHO NITAG. Uh, so we started off with healthcare workers and nursing homes, and then obviously the elderly, uh, moving on with age groups, other frontliners, um, and then eventually also to vulnerable persons beyond. Uh, after, once we had the 70 plus, we also started the vulnerable population. And uh, basically the last opening up, so to say, of the vaccination program has been to 12 and 15 year olds. It was opened up early in June, but now there is an actual active vaccination drive starting towards the end of June since effectively most of these teens have finished their exams and now they are more available, so to say, for vaccination. Um, yesterday, the minister announced that as of July 19th, every Maltese resident um, with evidence of being, I think, apart obviously from the supply element, which is critical, needless to say, you have to have vaccines to give vaccines. 
Um, the in terms of vaccine hesitancy, we've seen we've seen some vaccine hesitancy, same as everybody else, but we've tried to have as much of an open communication channel with the public as possible. We had several players involved. There was no complex structure involved, really. So obviously, the Ministry for Health was using all its channels, be it online and offline, so not just social media, but also TV, radio, print. Okay. What was critical, especially this year, that we had all ministries giving the same message. I must admit, last year, we did have some discordance between different ministries. I guess most of you had that as well, especially those that are more economic driven. All right. This year, all ministries were in sync, as including obviously those who with an economic bent because they appreciated the value of having a vaccinated population for the restart of the economy. We also had the Malta Association for Public Health Medicine, which, which brings together the uh, specialists in public health that set up a dedicated coronavirus webpage on Facebook. And this is highly subscribed to, actually, very popular. Um, and we did have a lot of public health physicians, you know, amongst us and other healthcare professionals engaging directly with queries on social media, on news websites, you know, the comment section, and trying to debunk and pre-bunk as much as possible um, at an individual basis. Okay, so there was some coordination between us, you know, where they get stuck, they typically would get back to some of us in public health to get access to the latest information. Information. But we basically had this informal social media uh, network of individuals trying to answer people's questions. So basically, the communication was formal and informal, online and offline. But I think what was definitely key was investing in our primary care physicians. All right. The public here has a lot of trust in their family doctor. And we need, we, and try to ensure as much as possible that the family doctors were with us, the family doctors were abreast of the science of all the development. Um, and I think this has helped a lot in addressing vaccine hesitancy amongst the population. Um, I don't have the coverage rates here right now, um, but uh, at this point, if I'm not mistaken, we have 85% uh, of adults uh, vaccinated with one dose and 80% or so with the second dose. Uh, so that's that's the situation from Malta. I think I cannot emphasize more the issue on communication. That said, vaccine hesitancy or most misinformation that we have been combating has not been coming from Malta. It has yep. been coming from our neighbors. And this is also the pocket that we are struggling with most. Our foreign residents that are still hooked up to their country's social media networks that are still full of misinformation and disinformation. Thank you very much. Neville, thank you so much. And quite impressive, you know, the achievement with regards to governance and politics that every, every ministry, every department was on the same page and you communicated together, but also your success in uh, communicating and addressing the infodemics. And Neville, we had you a couple of weeks earlier in one of our webinars with the WHO colleagues from headquarters on managing infodemics. And it was quite impressive to see that small countries with small resources and capacity can also do quite effectively actually counter these these attacks I, I need to see. Thank you so much, Neville. And um, that takes us to our next uh, speaker and our next country. It's Claudio from San Marino. Claudio, the floor is all yours. Good morning. In greeting uh, you all from San Marino, let me start with some uh, wonderful news. Since uh, yesterday, San Marino is officially free. In our country, there are no positive cases of COVID-19 and so today we can say San Marino is COVID free. Since the beginning of pandemic, we have had 50, we have had 50, 92 cases of, uh, cases of COVID-19, which uh, 90 died and uh, 5,002 recovered. This slide 
from uh, our COVID-19 infection management uh, dashboard shows uh, data on the pandemic in San Marino. In this slide, you can see the trend. Uh, the first wave from uh, 1st March to the 1st July 2020. And the uh, second, the longer and more intense second wave from uh, 1st November 2020 to the 1st July 2021. In, uh, you saw, you saw the, slide, the, 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 the two wave. And uh, in this slide, uh, you can uh, see the green part indicate those who have been vaccinated and the red part, those who have not uh, vaccinated. More, more than 80% uh, of over 60 population has been vaccinated. The schedule of the vaccination was planned by age and professional group. First, the over 16 and the health worker. Then those uh, vulnerable people and uh, school workers and teachers. During this period, we have had uh, two main challenges. The first is political, getting the vaccine. The second is management system, getting as many people as possible vaccinated in a short time. Both challenges were uh, overcome thanks to the government decision to use Sputnik V due to difficulty to find the EMA approved vaccines. We can now appreciate its safety and immunization capacity. Both, both aspects are currently the subject of specific studies, the first at the University of Bologna and the second at the Spallanzani Hospital in Rome. The second challenge was much more exciting. The deployment of vaccines in San Marino took place at a stratospheric speed once the vaccines were supplied. After about a month from the beginning of vaccination, combined 11.4% of San Marino residents had been immunized with two doses. A little more than a month after the beginning of the vaccination campaign, there has been a clear decrease in incident of the new diagnosis of COVID-19. In this slide, you show this, uh, this, uh, this andament, uh, this, uh, this line, this blue line is the, the new case, uh, and the red line is the, the, the first dose of vaccine, and the gray line is the second dose of vaccine. From over 200 cases per week in the first half of March to less than 30 cases in the second half of April. April. Since uh, in 12 of May, we don't have any new cases. This was possible thanks to hard work and contribution of all health workers who made themselves available in every way, including the help of retired medical staff. We have achieved 68% coverage with first dose and 62 coverage with second dose in the population. From this experience, we have learned the importance of networking with other countries, the need not to remain isolated, and to afford the need for more and more mutual support between the European small countries. Thanks. Audio, thank you so much. And first of all, congratulations to be COVID free. And we all cross fingers that this will remain as, as is because that is a great achievement. And I think it also came across quite clearly that your challenge is bigger than the challenge of those uh, small countries which are members of the EU. And I find it quite surprising, actually, to be frank, that small countries were not included into the EU facility, because I think that should have been easy. But congratulations to manage to get enough vaccine and to get your population vaccinated. And also that um, apparently um, vaccine hesitancy in your country hasn't played, played a role, but you seem to roll out your uh, campaign uh, very effectively. Great. So that's the moment where we go to our third speaker, Mojca Gobek from uh, Slovenia. Mojca, please, the floor is all yours. Hello to everyone. 
Uh, I'm Mutsa Gobert. I'm coming from the Ministry of Health, and I'm happy to share some information with you about the vaccination in Slovenia. Um, um, so um, thank you for all presentation uh, till now. Uh, and, must, and I must uh, say that in Slovenia, the situation is not so favorable as in Malta, as in San Marina, as we heard. Um, we started with a vaccination in December. Uh, we didn't have, um, we, we shared the, the difficulties with procurement of vaccine with other EU countries. But I think that we were quite successful with scaling up vaccination centers and the primary health care system in Slovenia um, uh, was, there was a focus on the primary health care to deliver the vaccination. We uh, prioritized uh, the vaccination group just uh, we heard. Um, and uh, we also organized the vaccination for vaccination for hard to reach groups. But what has happened? Uh, now we have uh, the data, as you can see, uh, the average uh, vaccination rate uh, among those uh, 15, uh, 18 and more is 47% with the one dose and the 40% with uh, the second dose. Um, so with this last number, we are somewhere in the average of the EU countries, but we are uh, not so good um, with the uh, vaccination rate uh, with the first dose of vaccine. So um, we have the highest vaccination rate between the age group um, between 70 and 89, but still we haven't reached the 80% or more. And of course, this is a quite a big challenge as we know that the new variants are of concern are um, in uh, Europe and also in Slovenia. So we also follow the vaccination rate uh, between the, our regions. And here you can see the uh, here on the, the bottom on the slide uh, that there are some differences, but not so big. Um, and that the uh, women are better vaccinated than men. Uh, what we can, what are the main challenges now for Slovenia? Um, as I said, uh, we have already noticed the new variant Delta also in Slovenia. So we are really um, worried and we will do our best to increase vaccination rate for those among 50 and more, because we know that uh, those are more uh, vulnerable for hospitalization and also for uh, um, uh, more problematic outcome of COVID-19. Um, to point out some good, uh, good things um, which happened in Slovenia, I must say that we made uh, great steps in uh, digitalization. So uh, here the primary health care and also the IT tools have been, uh, uh, have been uh, set up and also used. Uh, and we also take care for the older population who has not, uh, uh, who cannot uh, take up these uh, new uh, IT uh, tools. We have to admit that we have a vaccine hesitancy. Um, People do not uh, do not uh, go for vaccination. Although we really make sure that um, in these days the vaccination is available uh, almost everywhere, 
So in primary health center, in GPs, in um, on the spots, uh, we also for the uh, vulnerable population, we have the possibility to be vaccinated at homes. We vaccinate people at hospitals, also for outpatient uh, um, uh, for outpatient um, clinics. Um, it's possibility to for people to be vaccinated, but still, uh, it's a, it's a, quite a challenge to to raise up uh, our numbers. So, in last weeks, we really focus on local communities. So we try to engage mayors and all local structures uh, to really promote vaccination and to make sure that the. Uh, vaccination sites are really close to the people. We also invite the civil society uh, and also the, um, the representatives of social partners uh, like um, uh, economy, um, uh, directors of uh, uh, firms, uh, and to really build up um, a, a huge uh, network of those who try to address uh, the um, population or the certain groups of population uh, to, um, to be vaccinated. So uh, the local community, we think now uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a possibility um, to, to make uh, to make sure that the vaccination uh, rate will raise. Uh, so this will be my short presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moitza. And very interesting to see that the procurement went for you relatively well. The ramping up of facilities and including the primary care sector went relatively well. Digital, you made great progress, but the hesitancy is now uh, one of the problems. And clearly, you address uh, community, civil society, and uh, local municipalities, of course. But it will be interesting to see maybe in the panel discussion later on where the hesitancy is coming from. Neville was just saying it's coming from the outside, actually, and not from, from Malta. <laughs> interesting to hear uh, from where it comes. Thank you so much and um, for this great spotlight on uh, Slovenia. So, Erika, what have we heard? What is coming through the um, chat box? People are being shy in the chat box, but I have been getting some questions through. So uh, please do ask your questions because we probably only have time for two rounds of questions. So get in early to avoid disappointment. But just a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, one is a very practical question. Um, and that's about monitoring and keeping up with the sort of administrative burden of pandemic resp uh, response monitoring um, and reporting. Has that been a particular issue for smaller countries? And how do you monitor for things like variants of concern and, and that sort of thing? The more sort of, if that's not too technical a question. Um, another uh, question was about what are the particular networking challenges uh, for the small countries, given that it's a mix of EU and non-EU countries? And have you got any top tips um, for uh, countries such as the one I live in that are no longer EU members? Um, and what are, who are the hard to reach groups in your countries? So uh, are, are there any particularities around that? Um, and there are, I have more questions, but let's start with that for now. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, we would like to start with um, Leda, but Bettina, please do come in and co-facilitate this session with me. Leda, yeah. please pick out the question which you are best suited to answer. I am going to answer the question about the hard to reach groups because this is a, an issue that came up in the development of the, of the snapshot. And the hard to reach groups tended to be, uh, there were a lot of elderly or people who were just not digital for various reasons, not only elderly, they were just people who are not digital. So this is a, this is a, a gap or a, a group of people that we cannot forget. Um, and as you see, many of the countries, we st as, we, as we move ahead, we still need to, we can't forget people who are not, we can't assume that everybody is digital. So that would be the answer to that question. Um, yeah. yeah. Please, Neville. 
Um, in our case, the elderly were not actually the hard to reach population, but it was clear that we had to communicate with the elderly, not via social media. Um, uh, so, you know, the traditional channels have helped a lot. And again, the family doctor, he was key there, he or she were, you know, was key there to achieve that trust in that group. The problems we have are with the expats. Um, the communication channels that we have don't penetrate that well into these communities. They're very closely knit. In fact, we're trying to work with workplaces now uh, where these experts work, because otherwise it's very, very difficult to penetrate these groups. Um, coming to another question, if I may, um, uh, of the, of that Erika um, posed earlier, in terms of sequencing, um, uh, the numbers at this point in Malta are low enough that we can actually sequence everything. Um, so basically what's happening is we are using a slightly different type of PCR that allows you to um, actually distinguish between variants at that point, but we're also going for genomic sequencing then of the identified variant, uh, you know, non-wild type cases. So I hope, I hope that helps. Neville, you mentioned that the family doctors play a very important role with regards to the hard to reach group. And I think that's a very important lesson to take because um, vaccination centers might be very effective, but uh, exactly these groups, they will not reach out to them. And therefore, we need other other ways to get uh, get in contact. Thank you so much. So, um, Claudio. Our uh, campaign, vaccine campaign, have a, a, a big, a big uh, uh, publicity is uh, all the people, all the population have uh, uh, contact with uh, information, direct information by uh, health worker and uh, with uh, uh, TV and uh, media communication. Um, the people, San Marino population have uh, a, a big sensibility with uh, the vaccine. So um, many Many people came in uh, with the the hub for the vaccine, and uh, is uh, very very happy to to have the vaccine uh, vac to have the vaccine. Excellent. So again, the health workforce plays a very vital role, of course, together with public communication to get the messages out and also to reach out to these, these groups. Claudia, can I ask you on the second part, because I think that's also very interesting. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, one, one, one person in the audience asked a question with regards to the networks, and you were mentioned this in the presentation that you had to network and reach out to other countries um, to purchase vaccine for solidarity and all this kind of stuff. Did you have these networks before or did you just create them because of the COVID-19? Yes, the network is uh, created before because the, the, the small countries have uh, before have the opportunity is uh, together. But uh, the, the emergency with uh, the pandemic uh, show uh, this is uh, very, very important for the small countries if uh, the, the, the support is uh, if the together support because non, uh, it's not simple for the small countries if the, uh, the resource, the, the personal resource, the economic resource, and so and so and so. Uh, for San Marino, is very, uh, uh, very challenges for the economic resource because it is the small country and so for ma many many time many days is closed the activity is closed and uh, is important have the, the, the support with another other country another another thing is the the, the health worker uh, in this in this period in this time the health worker in the hospital work very hard And so we we have need uh, the support of the worker from another another country. Is better the support another country worker as worker from uh, country, the small countries. For us, it is a, a, a big challenge of this. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think Bettina, you wanted to come in directly on directly on this issue, and then we go to Moitza. 
Bettina. Yeah, no, I actually wanted to add on a couple of issues. The first one was uh, nobody has yet looked at the monitoring. Uh, some of our small countries in the interviews we did and also last week at the high level meeting, I mean, many of our small countries are overburdened by the reporting requirements which are on one end to the WHO, it's at the national level, it's through the national TV and radio and whatever stations, it's on the website, but also at the international level. It's a continuous for very small countries, not having enough stuff, this is a real burden, okay? And also the accuracy because of the population denominator is not always uh, easy to capture when compared in international statistics. That's one issue. Second point, variants. Some countries are lucky, like Malta was just uh, mentioning their change to the PCR, um, but not all of our small countries can um, um, identify the variants and they are sending it to neighboring countries like France or Spain in this case, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, to, to know what is actually happening. On the networking, one issue with I, I, I just got into this job, as you know, uh, a month ago, two months now almost, right, uh, in the, as coordinating the Small Country Initiative and the Regions for Health. But one of the issues I learned, and which is absolutely surprising, I mean, fantastic, is the, the three levels of communities of practice, which have been, which are visible over these seven, eight years of existence. The first one, the political level working on for example, getting access to the vaccines, getting access to medicines, big issue, right? So focusing at the highest level of politics up on those issues. The second level is community of practice with the senior health professionals. I mean, for example, we had the health care workforce working group of small countries to identify the big problems which are existing, particularly with regard to commuting, recognition of the professions, et cetera, et cetera. And the third level is actually all around because you get a lot of networking interest by other observers or other uh, agencies who would like to become part or would like to discuss and be part of the story. So, and I think these three levels are extremely important to communicate with each other. And I stop here, I've talked long enough, uh, but I hope it has Thank been you. Helpful. Thank you, um, Bettina. Luckily in some of the small countries, People have different hats off, and I see Neville, who has also raised his hands, who is an, a fine academic and at the same, same time a government official. And I think that's probably the case for, for many of, of those in small countries. But now we want to hear, hear uh, Moitza. Moitza, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to say that uh, Slovenia built uh, quite a robust uh, network for um, detecting variants of concern, and we used also the help of the U European Commission. So uh, we are at the, quite a safe site here. Um, concerning the, the vulnerable groups, I would like to mention in Slovenia, we have the Roma population, we have migrants, we have uh, homeless people. So we have to find ways how to uh, reach them. And according to last words of how, how small countries uh, struggle during the COVID, uh, whole, uh, whole uh, era of COVID and also now vaccination, I would like to, to say that uh, for us, this is really, uh, it's difficult because there is a limited number of, um, um, of uh, employees working from the beginning. And I think that this time is now it's more than a year, year and a half, and the, the new and new challenges are coming. So for us, it's quite difficult. And not just with health workers, really, who are in the front line. And we really, um, the primary health center really um, um, made a great work now uh, in testing and in vaccination, but also for the officials and for all the, um, the duties we have uh, with limited number of persons. This is a quite a, a quite a challenge and we should, uh, after all this, consider how we should build up for the that, that resonates very well with what Bettina was saying on the burden of uh, monitoring and communicating, which is sometimes underestimated and not seen because we are 
and rightly so looking at the frontline workers who are under a lot of pressures but it's not only them it's the entire management system the entire administration and many people who are not necessarily seen in the hospitals or the primary care practices very good i think um erica maybe we have time for a second quick round that's still neville and uh, neville you still want to come in on this issue Uh, just uh, to support what was being said on networking, I think one advantage of small countries is that we all know each other, not just within our countries, but also between us. So the networking that has been established by WHO Europe uh, over the previous years has proved priceless uh, in COVID response. I mean, I must admit, I've been on the phone with my counterpart in Iceland to ask about how to set up quarantine hotels, I've been talking to San Marino on sharing guidances for different sectors. I've been talking to Montenegro on, 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 on zero prevalence surveys. So it was a very, very slick and informal network which proved priceless for us working in small countries. I, I think that cannot be emphasized enough. We've also seen such a strong support from WHO coming on the infodemics, for example, for countries and of course, Larger countries probably are not so much in need of some of this, but, um, you know, in Europe, we usually say that all countries are small countries. The, some of them just haven't realized it yet. <laughs> so, Erika, um, is there com something coming through? Yes, we've got a couple of big questions to finish with. Um, so, first of all, if you were to advise bigger countries on their COVID response, what advice would you give to them? From, from your experience, what advice would you give to bigger countries to, for example, with uh, San Marino to achieve eradication or with Malta to achieve your really high vaccination rates? So what advice would you give? And the second big question is, what are your main concerns as you look to the next six months, but also to the next six years? In your Excellent country? questions. Uh, so Leda, please start. Okay. Um... The first question is, <laughs> is pretty hard as I'm not a country and I have an overview, an overview from a number of countries. Um, I would say though, that from what I've, the information I've collected, it's important to capitalize on what you have found has worked. So small countries tend to be laboratories for innovation. They can start things quicker and you can see results quicker. And many times, this can be applicable to smaller parts of a larger company of a larger country and it can be scaled up so maybe they can look at some of the best practices or the promising practices in small countries and see how that may be scaled up or applicable to their context um, thank you later so even even more reasons to look into small countries even if you're a big country <laughs> neville please um, i'll be short so for the first question i would just say listen to the public, listen to everyone, monitor and act rapidly. I think those the, that's the key reason why uh, response has been actually relatively uh, good in smaller countries. And On the second question, sorry, are you addressing no, no, the second question? Um, I think the only certainty we have had the past 18 months is uncertainty. So, you know, I mean, six months, six years from now, we really have to play it by ear. Um, and have contingency plans. Um, otherwise, I don't think you can predict much. Thank you so much, um, Neville. And I think uh, your comment on listening is non-trivial because we have seen in many European countries that um, decision makers have not really listened to civil society, patient organization, municipalities. They were outside the decision-making process. And we are paying for this uh, now because um, they were never informed. They are is growing hesitancy and all this kind of stuff. So I think listening is, is really a very important uh, point you're making. Claudio, please. Yes, our, our advice for big countries is only one. The vaccine is priority. So if you need the priority, you need to inside the, all the, your resource. Uh, you need to vaccinate in a short time. It's not the, the The, 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 the vast the time. So all the resources, the, all the workers, all the health workers and the, uh, the, the hub for the vaccines is needed 
to start uh, in the in the short time. Thank you so much. And I think this is uh, also pointing a little bit that some countries in Europe have been not so quick on their feet or that decision-making processes were clunky and lengthy and uh, decisions to move into lockdown, uh, moving out of lockdown were too late, too early. And uh, I think we take this as a, as a good advice. Thank you so much. And now Moitza. Um, my advice would be um, build a robust primary health care and rely on it also on public health crisis. Uh, and the second, the, regarding the next um, period in front of us, uh, those who will be better vaccinated will have easier time. Yes. So let's vaccinate. Thank you so much, Moitza. And I think uh, in this session today, it was clear the vital role primary care plays, not only in terms of administering the vaccine, but also reaching out to some of the heart to, to reach group, actually, and also... Uh, getting involved in the communication. And I hope that when we build back better now in Europe, you know, with all the funds available, that we are not just uh, looking into pandemic responses, but strengthening primary health care for all this. So that's great. Thank you so much. And um, it's actually now time to uh, wrap up. And I've asked my colleague uh, Bettina to, to help on this one, to share a couple of key messages coming from this. And later, if you want to come on board, please uh, feel free to do so. Quick, Bettina. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks also to everybody who uh, gave his time and her time to, to be with us. I mean, there's no doubt, supply of vaccine, vaccinating 80% of our people as rapid as possible is a priority and remains a priority. And how the small countries did it and how you're proceeding rapidly, I think it's really one of the issues the laborator like the real time lapse of innovation which 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 we did share today and we shared in the paper so but a lot of work needs to be done further second point and nobody talked about we cannot not have any more public health measures the variants of concern are spreading very rapidly and those, therefore, public health and primary health care play, and the media, the communication, play an extremely important role to get over vaccine hesitancy, to get people also to the outside borders, but also to uh, actually deal with the public health measures, which are absolutely essential to move on for the next six months. I don't know. I don't hope for six years, right? <laughs> At least for the next six months. So uh, then the third point is when we are dealing with planning for the next six months, 18 months, and that's what we also discussed at the high level meeting, it is really the issue about scale in terms of time and scale in terms of people. So what I want to say is this, we need to be able, as soon as we have a new case emerging, for example, as San Marino now as no COVID, but assuming there might be a case, okay, immediately rapidly scaling up our action to, 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 to prevent um, a, a further larger uh, increase of numbers. Uh, we have the instruments for this. We have learned from the past on this and how to do it better. But this is also the key element for the preparedness and response future development. Last but not least, engagement of communities. I mean, the community is not only, it's our health professional communities, it's our PHC, uh, primary health care, health professional communities. It's us between us, right? Like we now work European Observatory with the Venice office, right? To get this out and listen to. There are other communities of practice and this is the real engagement we need to further have. And yeah, there are many other issues uh, to mention like uh, medicines, et cetera, et cetera, but this is not the time for this. And I'm very much looking forward to have another round to present <laughs> another innovative lab as Leda called it in the future months to come. And would like to thank all the speakers and you and uh, Leda and Katie and Siddhartha and the observatory who was behind the development of this paper and all the countries who submitted the information.
Okay. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you so much. And there's nothing left for me to add apart from saying thank you to the excellent overview from the spotlight speaker, Lea, and the great insights into um, Malta, San Marino, and uh, Slovenia. And um, we say goodbye, not just until next week, but we are taking a break now, actually, um, for the summer. And we hope to see you back on probably a slightly different topic on different issues in September. So bye-bye and take care. And please don't miss it. This one will be made available on our YouTube channel. Bye-bye.